Easter Sunday. What an awesome time we've had already in this ministry and in this service. But God's far from finished, amen? (laughs) When Jesus said it is finished on the cross, the cross was finished. But God wasn't done yet, amen? Jesus rose on that third day. You know, I think in my mind, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to get to this in just a second, but, but I think in my mind as you read through the passages and the narratives, the different gospels and the take that they had on what happened that day, some included other details than others. But the takeaway, I was thinking that when the stone, when the, the stone rolled away from the tomb, <laughs> the Roman soldiers, the Bible says, they fell over like dead men. <laughs> You know, when you experience something like that, there's nothing that your physical body can do to contain that. I want God to move in such a way in your life on this day that the resurrection power overwhelms you to the point where you have no choice but to follow Jesus. Amen? The resurrection This morning, we join with 2.3 billion Christians. That's billion with a B. One third of the earth's population today celebrates the risen Savior. That's a lot of people. It's an amazing thing when you begin to think about it. It's hard to wrap around mentally how many people... (laughs) are right now doing exactly what we're about to do to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? You know, it it would really be, by definition, an April Fool if you didn't accept this gospel message. There is so much evidence. You know, for years, we celebrate this resurrection power and for years it's important to understand this morning as we look at this event in history that changed the course of the world we know that atheists and agnostics professors and archaeologists have been trying desperately to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ and you know there is testimony after testimony that if you take a moment and read about it you'll find people that say I set out to disprove Jesus I set out to say there was a man that he didn't die for everybody's sin and he didn't raise from the dead. And when I set out to disprove it, guess what? I came to a place where I had to make a decision. My question was not, did it really happen? Because the evidence was overwhelming. And spiritually, something happened in my heart. I knew I was hearing God call me. But I made a decision. I had to make a decision. Either I would accept this resurrection power by faith or I would deny Jesus Christ. The question today, friends, is not did Jesus rise from the dead. He did. He did. We join with 2.3 billion others saying he did. The question is, will you accept him? I pray that after today, everyone in this room will no longer be confused, will no longer be in the dark, about who Jesus is and what Jesus can do in your life and through your life, but all of us will stand on common ground, the ground that is at the foot of the cross, and accept the sacrifice of the risen Lord in our lives. Today, I hope and pray that as we look through John chapter 20, this event that happened over 2,000 years ago would change your life today. For those of us in the room that maybe haven't heard this story, but maybe a couple times, maybe we've never heard it before, then I pray as you learn it today, it will change your life. There are others that have heard this many times. And every time I feel like I've heard this story a lot, I meet a saint of God that's been serving serving the Lord for way longer than I have. And guess what? They're even more excited about Jesus than I am in most cases. There was a man who worked at a camp I used to go to. His name was Mr. Bird, but he he wasn't related to me. And he worked in the craft shop. And every time he would talk about Jesus, he would weep. 
and he would cry. He had been serving the Lord for decades. Listen, friend, if you're here today, don't think this message, this resurrection power has faded. (laughs) If anything, it grows year after year. Amen? Let it move in your heart and your life today. Let's talk about the resurrection. John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Before I begin, let us pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that we have today to look at this story. I pray, God, that you would make it real to us. Help us, oh God, to be literally taken to this location, to experience what it was like to be there at an empty tomb, to experience the risen Lord face to face. Holy Spirit, move in this place. We invite you to change our hearts, change our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Let me remind you or catch you up with who Mary Magdalene was. Mary Magdalene, the Bible teaches us, is is someone who Jesus prayed for to deliver from demonic possession. Seven demons came out of this gal when Jesus prayed for her. This was a woman who was completely committed to who Jesus was. He had changed her life from the inside out. When he found her, she was a wreck. The the devil was doing with her whatever he pleased. But Jesus set her free. Amen? And so Mary was the first one at the tomb because her everything had died. The man who delivered her from demonic possession was killed on a cross and it rocked her world. And so she went to the tomb to pay respects, not expecting to see what she saw. Verse 2 says, She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved. That's John. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Listen. There's two things that she said that really stuck out to me. The word they, say they. And we don't know. Say we don't know. Well, I'm going to tell you. (laughs) Many times we get caught up in this blame game. Things happen in our lives that we don't understand. We don't know what the outcome might be. We don't know why things happen. Mary Magdalene runs and tells the disciples because she didn't know who to blame. And so she said, they. How many times maybe have we been in, a, in an experience in our life where we just, we throw that word they out there. Well, they didn't listen. They let me go from the job. I was doing a good job. They walked out on me. I didn't walk out on them. They don't care about me. They don't listen to me. They don't. Do what I've asked them to do. This they thing is something that we use to cast blame. And when we say they in those times, most of the time when we're saying they, we're blaming this unknown thing. And a lot of times we want to attach it to the devil. But let me show you something for just a minute. Every closed door is not the devil's doing. Every experience we walk through that feels a little uncertain is not the devil's doing. Listen, if you're walking with Jesus, you can understand something that even in a place of confusion, God is in control. Mary was confused. I don't know. We don't know. Peter, John, what's going on? They didn't know Jesus was rose from the dead. They still hadn't grasped this thing that Jesus had told them. I'm coming back to life. He told them. They still didn't get it. We don't know. We don't know is a scary place to be. But don't let the we don't know keep you from God. In the we don't know moments, in the they moments, press in to God, not further away from God. The worst thing you can do is push away from the Lord Jesus when things get rough. The best thing you can do is press in a little further and say, God, what are you setting up? (laughs) <laughs> let, me, let me show you something. We know because we, we, we read this story. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. We're celebrating it here on Easter Sunday. But Mary had no idea. We don't know. God was setting up 
a miracle in Mary's life. You know, think about it this way. Mary was the first one to see Jesus after the resurrection. How crazy is that? She didn't recognize him. He was the gardener. So she went and said, Peter and John, I'm freaking out. We don't know. They this, they that. And then they came back. Peter and John, I'll talk to about them a little bit later. They went back home. Mary hung around. And the Bible tells us that a gardener was there. She thought it was the gardener. And she was crying. She said, why are you weeping, Mary? Why are you weeping? And she said, they've taken my Lord. Please tell me if you know where they took him. She's devastated. And then Jesus says, Mary. You see, when Jesus called her name, something happened. She recognized the voice of her Savior. <laughs> Let me tell you something. In your broken moment, in your most devastated place, listen for the voice of Jesus to call your name. He's closer than you think. I thought that was a cue for me to start singing. Somebody's phone. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Lord, y'all don't want me to sing this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's sovereign plan is not built on the dependability of mankind. Isn't that a blessing? God uses us in spite of ourselves. As Mary was walking through this, she was confused, she was frustrated. But then we see... God was doing something amazing. He knew exactly what he was doing. Verse 3, let's go on and talk about Peter and John for a moment. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings, wrappings lying there. Verse 7. While the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded, was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. And he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Listen to me. We understand from this story and other, the other gospels that Peter really didn't understand that Jesus rose from the dead. He still didn't get it. God bless him. John, the Bible says, believed. So John believed and Peter still was confused. But they both did the same thing. What was that last statement? Then they went home. Listen. That's one of the hardest things for me to wrap my head around is to come into contact with someone that has a radical experience with God and then they go back to how they were before. I, I, I can't wrap my head around it. But I also don't judge because it's not my job to do that. Amen? Here's the thing. What's worse? To know the truth like John did, or to miss the truth altogether. You see, John knew the truth that he believed, and he went home with Peter. Peter didn't know the truth, and he went home. So which one is in a better, is in a worse situation here? They both went back to what they were doing before. Pastor, why is that bad? That's bad because God wants to use you in a miraculous fashion. He didn't just save you for you. He didn't just save you for you. When Jesus sets you free, guess what? Immediately there's a mandate upon your life. There are lost people that need Jesus. And with each and every person that makes a commitment to Jesus Christ, there's people that you can reach that nobody else can. They both went home. You know, how many times have we known the truth, heard the call of God, felt the tug of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts, and ignored it altogether? What we understand from this story, and even more from the life of Peter, 
is that God's love is never ending. It's constantly reaching out to us. And I don't think there's anyone that can relate more to that than the Apostle Peter himself. Let's hear his story this morning. At that sound. My name is Peter, but, but that's not who I used to be. Before I met Jesus, my name was Simon, a reed blown around by the wind, easily swayed, weakness, constant, no constant in my life. I was always up and down. That was my nature without Jesus. But, but Jesus saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. He saw some potential that I couldn't even see. He, he called me Peter, a rock. How ironic. I can't even count the number of times that I've messed up, said the wrong thing, acted out of impulse and did the wrong thing. Oh, I, I always had good intentions. I just didn't seem to be able to live up to them. Yeah, my nature was Simon. And just about the time it seemed like I would get it right, I'd start to get a little self-righteous and then blow it big time again. And Jesus was so forgiving. I remember one time I said, Jesus, I've forgiven this guy over and over and over again. How many times must I forgive him? I've forgiven him seven times. He's offended me so many times. Jesus said, forgive him 70 times seven. As many times as it takes. I'm so thankful now that that's his heart because I've needed his forgiveness 70 times seven. One time, Jesus asked all of us, he said, who do people say that I am? And then he said, who do you say that I am? Well, I, it was one of those moments that I, I was getting it right. I, it was just a God moment. And I, and I said, you, you're the Messiah. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus put his hand on my shoulder and he said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, you are Peter. And I'm going to use you to build my church. Felt pretty good. At that moment, felt like I was getting it right. But then just a moment later, Jesus started saying how he must suffer and, and die. I, I, I rebuked him. I said, I said God forbid... This will never happen to you. Jesus looked at me and said, Get behind me, Satan. You're seeing merely from a human point of view right now and not from God's point of view. One minute I'm a rock, the next minute I'm Satan. One minute I'm seen from God's point of view. And the next minute I'm merely seen from a human point of view. Simon. I remember as we came together for what would be the last meal we would share together. Jesus looked straight at all of us and he said, You will all desert me. But when I've raised from the dead, I'll meet you again in Galilee. He knew we were all going to fail. And yet he was reassuring us of his love and forgiveness even before we did. Well, I, I, I said, not me, Lord. <laughs> Everyone else may forsake you, but I will never forsake you. I'll suffer with you. I'll die with you if necessary, but I'll never disown you. With such love, Jesus looked at me and he said, Peter, on this very night, before the rooster crows, three times you'll deny that you know me. 
Then he put his arm around my shoulder again and said, Simon, Simon. Satan has desired to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you've repented and returned to me, use your story to strengthen your brothers. Well, later that night, Jesus asked me to go for a walk with him in the garden. He asked me to stay awake and to pray with him. He seemed so troubled. It, was, it seemed as if he was carrying the weight of my guilt. But I couldn't stay awake. I, I kept dozing off. And I don't know how long I'd been asleep, but Jesus awakened me and, 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 and said, Peter, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation. I said, Peter, your spirit is willing, but your flesh... Is so weak. Well, then, at that moment, it seemed like just all chaos broke out. And when, when Judas arrived with the soldiers and they were arresting Jesus, and I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I just acted out of impulse. I, I pulled my sword and I cut off the ear of one of the soldiers. And Jesus stopped me and said, Peter, put your sword away. You're still reacting from the view of of a human point of view and not God's point of view. I, I was scared. I, I ran. I ran out of the garden. I, I tried to stay out of sight. And, and then I, I followed from a distance to see where they were taking Jesus. It occurs to me that maybe some of you today have been allowing your fears to keep you distant from Him. Well, I, they took Him to the home of the high priest, and, and I stood outside in the courtyard trying to be unnoticed, but I could see through the doorway they were spitting on Jesus' face. With their fists, they were beating him in the face over and over again. About that time, a, a servant girl outside walked over to me, and she said, I think I saw you with him. Weren't you one of his disciples? Weren't you one of his followers? And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I don't know the man. I, I tried to step away, but then someone else stopped me and said, No, I thought I saw you with him. I think you're one of his disciples. And I said, No, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. I've never known him. And, and I tried to turn to leave, but, but the crowd began gathering around then. And then someone said, wait a minute, your speech gives you away. You talk like it. I can tell you are one of his followers. And, and to prove I wasn't, I cursed. And I swore I never knew him. And just then, the rooster began to crow. I turned and looked back to see Jesus staring right at me through the doorway. That bruised, bloody face, those eyes of compassion just pierced right through me as if he were saying, I still love you, Peter. I, I left. I, I ran away. I just I wept. How could he ever forgive me? How could he ever trust me again? Have you ever felt like you just can't do anything right? I needed another chance. But how many do-overs could I possibly get? And you know I always meant to do things right. I love you, Lord. And when I think of how I failed you, I could cry. And when I hear you calling me, I want to run and hide. Yet you know I love you so. 
I love you, Lord. Although I know my heart may not seem true. I love you, Lord. And I've prayed for one more chance to prove I do. I want to leave the past behind and feel your smile again, Lord, you know. I love you so. I love you so. So if you find it in your heart to let me start again, I'll be your witness, Lord, your witness, Lord, your witness to the end of my life. Let me make it right. Let me try again. I'll be your witness to the end. If you find it in your heart to let me start again, I'll be your witness, Lord, your witness, Lord, your witness to the end of my life. Let me make it right. Let me try again. I'll be your witness to the end. Just let me try again. Well, they crucified him. I watched him die on that cross. I went with the others and we, we went into a house where we were hiding for fear that the soldiers would be coming for us next. Two nights we had been there, grieving, broken, hopeless. Just as the sun began to rise, I, I heard the distant sound of, of a rooster crowing, and I was overwhelmed with guilt. Gates and doors were barred, the windows fastened down. I spent the night in sleeplessness, arose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. And just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle, and a voice began to call. So I hurried to the window and looked down into the street, expecting swords and torches and the sound of soldiers' feet. There was no one there but Mary. So I went down to let her in And John stood there beside me As she told us where she'd been She said they've moved him in the night And none of us know where The stone's been rolled away And his body isn't there We both ran toward the garden Then John ran on ahead we found the stone and the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said The winding sheets they wrapped him in Was just an empty shell How or where they'd taken him Was more than I could tell Something strange had happened there But just what I did not know John believed a miracle but I just turned to go. Circumstance and speculation couldn't lift me very high. 
because I'd seen them crucified. Then I saw him die. Back inside the house again, the guilt and anguish came. Everything I'd promised him just added to my shame. When at last it came to choices, I denied I knew his name. Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. And suddenly, the air was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. And light that came from everywhere drove shadows from the room. And Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. And I fell down on my knees and just clung to him and cried. Then he raised me to my feet as I looked into his eyes. Love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. And every fear I'd ever had melted into peace. He's alive, he's alive, and he's forgiven me. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive, and I'm forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive, and I'm Forgiven, heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive, and we're forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. He's alive, he's alive, he's alive, he's alive. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. He's alive. He's alive. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You know, that's something that sets us apart as followers of Christ. We don't worship some idol. We don't have to pray towards some city. <laughs> Our God in Jesus Christ is alive. Amen? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I want to pick up right where Peter left off with my remaining moments. In verse uh, 19 of chapter 20, it reads, That Sunday evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors, just as Peter had explained, because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace. Be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. I want to stop right there and just try to, let's just try to go to this room for a moment. So Jesus, remember the story as he spoke to the winds and the waves and said, peace be still. He used the same words to calm the room. <laughs> so all of a sudden, they're locked down, they're hunkered down, they're scared of the, the uh, officials coming to drag them away. The, the Jewish leaders wanted to kill everything associated with Jesus. They wanted to kill Lazarus because he had raised Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to kill Jesus' followers because they didn't want this Jesus thing to catch on. And so they were scared. And as they're in this room, all of a sudden, it was probably a lot like he described, Jesus appears. says it right here in Scripture. How did he just appear? They were in their 
behind locked doors. Let me remind you that we understand if we study in Corinthians and continue to look at this thing called the resurrection, did you know that all of us will one day, if we follow Jesus Christ and receive him as our Savior, we will one day walk around in glory with a glorified body? Amen. Some of us need a glorified body today a little more than we... See, Jesus literally could float through walls. The laws of nature didn't apply to him anymore. He put himself, the Bible says, he wrapped himself in flesh to die upon a cross. But when he rose, he had the scars of the crucifixion, but his body was a different body altogether. That's good stuff. And as he appeared in, the, in, the war, in this room, <laughs> everybody's first reaction was probably fear. They still didn't understand, for the most part, that Jesus was going to come back to life. They, Jesus all of a sudden appeared. Hey, guys, here I am. And they probably got a lot. They probably got scared to death. They were like, what? This is a ghost. They probably scattered. Peace, be still. Don't be afraid. And then as Jesus keeps talking, he says, look, here's the, here's the wounds. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm him. I'm really him. And so the fear switches from fear to incredible, overwhelming joy. The room must have been electric with energy as the disciples and the followers begin to realize, what? This is really Jesus. It finally clicks. He's he's alive. He's alive. There was so much excitement that Jesus literally had to say, peace be still. Like he spoke to the waves. These guys were finally understanding that they hadn't lost everything when Jesus died on the cross. In fact, they had gained everything. (laughs) Now Jesus stood before them fully alive. You know, it's interesting, this last verse here in verse 22, it says, Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. That's important because we need to understand before Jesus would give them the Holy Spirit, would anoint them for a task. In other words, he would send them out. If you, if you look back in the Gospels, he'd send them out to go preach over here or to go pray for those and to receive healing. And he would send them out on projects. But when they would come back, that was just for a season. They had not yet received the Holy Spirit the way that God had intended which had to happen after the resurrection. Why? Why couldn't Jesus just give them the Holy Spirit before? Because the Holy Spirit carries with it the authority over death, hell, and the grave. When we walk in a salvation experience, when our spirit man is born again and we become alive in Christ through the Holy Spirit, guess what? We now have no death. We now have an eternity in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so Jesus couldn't give that away because Jesus didn't have it yet. What? Go back to Genesis. Adam sinned. And when Adam sinned, the penalty was death. He gave literally by his sin the keys to death, hell, and the grave to the devil. The devil is the one who had the authority after Adam's sin. Listen to me. But Jesus had to come and die on the cross, and the Bible teaches us that he took back those keys of death, hell, and the grave, and now he's standing there fully alive, talking to the disciples, and guess what? Receive the Holy Spirit. Now you have the authority that I have. Now you can operate in the authority that I have won for you upon the cross. Amen? You see, the resurrection restored the eternal destiny of humanity back to its original owner, God himself. The sting of death was gone. The stench of decay was gone. And the spirit of life had been given. They had received this Holy Spirit, which was salvation. It was a seal of ownership. They had now been branded as children of God. 
The resurrection made this possible. Later they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that next Sunday. We keep going to verse 24. We talk about a guy named Thomas. Everybody say there's always one. So here we have Thomas in verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. What was so important that Thomas had to step out? Are you with me today? So we're already in the room. We've already experienced. We're in the room there, okay? We've experienced Jesus came. We're scared. And then he says, peace be still. And then we realize it's him. And we're excited. And then he says, peace be still again. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit. And Thomas is not there. (laughs) He had to go to QT or something to grab a slushie. I don't know what Thomas was doing, but Thomas, come on. There's always one, right? And so he gets back in verse 25. When he gets back, they told him, we have seen the Lord. They were probably pumped. Thomas, dude, you missed it. (laughs) Jesus literally, right where you're standing, he was like right there. And so Thomas, I imagine, slushy in hand. (laughs) But he replied, I won't believe it. Unless I see the nail wounds in his hands and put my fingers into them. First of all, seeing them is one thing. Putting your fingers into Thomas, come on. That's disgusting. But he didn't believe. You know, isn't it wonderful that the God that we serve loves us enough to go the extra mile? Eight days later. Eight days later, Jesus appeared again it says right in verse in verse 26 eight days later the disciples were together again and this time Thomas was with them the doors were locked again but suddenly as before Jesus was standing among them peace be with you he said then he said to Thomas put your finger here look at my hands put your hand into the wound in my side don't be faithless any longer believe my Lord and my God Thomas exclaimed Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Listen, there may be times that we feel like we've missed the boat. We've missed an opportunity. We may have fumbled the spiritual ball. God has entrusted you with something amazing and yet you dropped it. You missed it. Thomas's reaction was just to give up quickly, but then Jesus came again eight days later just for Thomas. Can I tell you something? It's not too late for you either. I don't care how many Easter services you've sat in or how many times you've heard the salvation call. This time can be the time that it changes your life. You need to hear this. The call of God upon your life is never revoked. The Spirit of God is ready to move in your life today to use you tomorrow to reach somebody and change their eternity. Thomas, there's many ways that God shows up in people's lives. Countless stories. Sometimes it's a dream. Sometimes it's a relationship that we have with someone and a conversation. Sometimes it's a crusade or a church service. The important thing is, is that when you finally stand in front of the throne of an almighty God, you have had that experience with Jesus. Verse 29 makes it pretty clear. Blessed are those who believe me without seeing me. All of us today are in that category if we've chosen to believe Jesus. I'll put it to you this way. In John chapter 21, the next chapter, Jesus visits the disciples at dawn. Peter is there, and he's gone back to what he was good at. He's gone back to fishing. He still really didn't know what to do with this thing, this Holy Spirit, this call. I'm supposed to be a rock, but I'm really good at fishing, so I'm just going to go do that. Jesus shows up before dawn 
early one day. What happens early in the morning? The roosters crow. You see, Peter had experienced roosters crowing after he denied Christ again and again, and every time it would remind him of his failure. You know, the devil likes to take things in our life that remind us of how much we've failed God. Don't be fooled by that lie. Because when the devil reminds you of how much you failed God, you remind him that it's not up to you. <laughs> it's the blood of Jesus Christ that redeems you, not your works. Amen? Amen. Jesus can still save. Jesus can still use. And here we have Peter, Jesus calling from the shore. Hey, guys, fish on the other side. And then they fish on the other side. And they catch all these fish. And then he says, hey, that miracle I just gave you, those 153 big fish, bring them to me. <laughs> what is happening here? They fished all night and had nothing to show for it. And then Jesus shows up and blesses them. And you know what he asks them to do with the blessing that they just got? Give it back. Bring it to me. Bring it to me. Listen to me. God didn't just bless you for you. <laughs> he blessed you to use you. For someone else, amen? amen? Your story, your story, like Peter's, could be the story that saves someone's life, that snatches them out of hell. Allow God to use you in that way. And as he's calling them to come forward and to bring that blessing, to bring that miracle, it's amazing that he has this conversation with Peter. Catch this got to say this and then I'll be done. How many times did Jesus deny, uh, did Peter deny Christ? How many? Three times. So Peter has this experience where he, you know, he, he thought pretty highly of himself. You know, I, I, I would never deny you. And then he said, you know, all these other guys, they'll deny you, but I won't. I'll, I'll die for you. And then he, then he denies Jesus. He's feeling a little lower about himself. But, but nobody heard. Not many people know what's going on. My, my buddies aren't here anyway. At least I'm here following Jesus and I'm denying Christ one time. It's just one time. And then he denies him again. And with each denial, Peter sinks a little lower. And then finally he curses Jesus and he denies him a third time. And, and Peter is now at his lowest point knowing that the rooster crowing is the thing that reminds him of his failure again and again. <laughs> and Jesus does something really cool. Watch this. Jesus pulls Peter aside after this experience on the shore. He says, Peter, do you love me? One time. Peter says, yeah, I, I love you, Lord. I love you. I know. I, you know I love you. Then he asks him again, Peter, listen, do, do you love me? Two times Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. I love you. You know and I love you. And the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I love you. You see, what Jesus is doing right there is what he wants to do for you today. Every denial was now wiped away with every affirmation of love. Every time Jesus asked him, it wiped away another failure. It wiped away another misstep. It wiped away another sin. And it gave Peter an opportunity now to stand on solid ground, on a zero footing, so to speak. The blood of the cross is strong enough to wipe away every single failure. And now Peter stands on level ground. Amen? Every denial wiped away.